general rule, unless the shape of the part prohibits it, like a square section part, we start the project by using a three-jaw chuck. Now, if we can complete the project without moving it in the chuck, well, we'll use the three-jaw chuck for the whole part. But if we can't, and if we have to move the part between its beginning and its end, well, we usually want to move on to a four-jaw chuck. Because the four-jaw chuck permits us to adjust the concentricity of our part to ensure that once we've moved it, we don't lose any concentricity. So today we're going to be looking at three different types of parts and how to center them in a four-jaw chuck. So I have my four-jaw chuck installed. I have my emergency stop button activated. I'm going to put my spindle in neutral so that I can turn the chuck manually with ease. I have my dial indicator, magnetic base mounted, and I have my three parts. The first part is cylindrical, relatively long and of small diameter. This will be the easiest part to center. The second part is of square section, and this is going to be the most difficult part to center. We'll see it's quite different from the others. The third part is of cylindrical shape as well, but is of large diameter and relatively short. This will give us some problems with end play or actual thrust that the other parts won't. So let's start with the easiest part to center. It's not a productive approach to put the part directly into the four-jaw chuck and just using our dial indicator start centering. It's far better to position the part in the chuck and center it by eye as best as possible. And then, once very centered, use our dial indicator for the final fine tuning. We can start by inserting the part in the four-jaw chuck and just really visually centering the part. This is a very rough centering at this point. We just want to snug the four jaws up to the part and have the part so that it looks like it's about in the center of the chuck. Since my spindle is in neutral, I can turn it by hand and verify visually how much out of round or eccentricity I have. At this point, there's several ways to verify the eccentricity of our part. The first and most obvious would be to compare the jaws to the part. Do the jaws look like they're in the center of the part in both planes? Another way would be to use the gauge lines on the face of the chuck and to verify that one of the lines looks to be about at the same position comparative to a point on each of the four jaws. So this point here seems to be at about the same position to this gauge line as the same point on the next jaw and the next and the next one after that. So we can see that we're pretty close here. So it'd be time to move on to our next level of centering by comparing the part to a fixed entity. It's still visual, but it's more precise. My fixed entity could be anything, but for me, for ease of movement, I'm going to choose the face of my tool post that I'm going to bring close up to the side of the part, ensuring, however, that it doesn't touch. From this angle, it's easy to compare the part to the fixed entity. And it's easy to see the amount of eccentricity that we have. It's important to note here that I don't want the part to touch the fixed entity. Just come close to it. And that for safety, I'm turning the chuck by hand with the spindle in neutral and the emergency stop button activated. So when I turn the part, it's easy to see which part of the piece that I'm trying to center is closest to the fixed entity. So if I look at it carefully, 
I can see that right here, this point is closest to my fixed entity. So my part is going to have to go in that direction away from the entity. So I'm going to loosen this jaw and tighten the opposite one. And remember, we're not centered yet. We're still going to have to work at it. So don't tighten everything down very, very tight. A little more than snug is all we need at this point. So now that we've adjusted it once and gotten it a little closer, we're going to turn the chuck by hand once again, find our new high spot, it's right there, and start over again. I can see here that we're getting pretty concentric, so I'm going to move things up a notch and bring my fixed entity a little closer to my part. So I'm going to move my fixed entity a little closer to the part I'm trying to center. And in doing that, I'm going to manage to reduce the space between the fixed entity and the part. This reduced space will permit a more accurate centering. So with the part turning very slowly, I can bring my fixed entity closer and I can see that right here is the spot where the part is closest to my fixed entity. So I'm going to loosen very slightly, remember we're getting close to center here, and tighten the opposite jaw. Now we can find our new high spot, it's right here, so I'm going to loosen very lightly and tighten the opposite jaw. Start over again, we're getting progressively closer. So right here is my new spot, loosen very very slightly, tighten the opposite. We're getting very close, right here, a final very small adjustment and we're getting close to the limit of what we can do with this comparative visual method of centering. Our eccentricity here should be well within three or four thousandths of an inch. If you require that it be even more concentric, well now would be the time to get our dial indicator out. Now, you may have noticed that I'm not just tightening the jaws of the four jaw chuck. We have to loosen one end and tighten the other because if all we do is tighten, well obviously we're going to end up much too tight. And many people break the screws on the four jaw chuck by over tightening. Now, it's certain that once everything is centered, everything has to be tight, but go at it progressively. Loosening is just as important as tightening here. Now we've pretty well hit the limit of what we can do visually. So now would be a good time to back everything off, install our dial indicator, and go for that final fine adjustment. Now, you want your dial to be as horizontal as possible. Obviously to be very visible and to be point of the dial about on the center of rotation of the part height-wise. Nothing about this is terribly accurate though. So don't get sick over aligning the dial indicator. What we're looking here for is movement, not dimensions. Now remember, we've taken time to center the part by eye as well as possible, so we're pretty close to being centered. So you don't need to bring your dial indicator up into the part by three turns of the dial. Really just bring the dial indicator up to the part and brush it by about ten thousandths of an inch, or in my case about ten lines. That way you won't get confused about which turn of the dial you're on. You're always at the very start of the dial. Turn the part by hand in order to find the high spot, or if you prefer, the spot on the part that's the closest to the dial indicator. So right here, and now I can reset the scale of my dial indicator to zero. When I turn the part, I can see that the hand on my dial indicator moves from about zero to minus eight, so about four thousandths of an inch out of round. So if my closest point is zero and my furthest point is minus eight, well I'll be on center somewhere around minus four thousandths of an inch. 
In this case, I'm going to move the part away from the dial indicator by about half the total movement shown on the dial. So the part has to come towards me by four thousandths of an inch. So I'm going to very lightly loosen off the jaw closest to myself and without moving the chuck, tighten very lightly the opposite jaw, keeping an eye on the dial to ensure that I'm moving only that four thousandths of an inch. I can now re-verify the concentricity of my part. Start over this tightening and loosening operation as many times as required to get the proper concentricity on your part. So my new high spot is right here, so I'll tighten that up just a little bit. Keep verifying until you're satisfied with the result. And then you can give it the old once around, just to ensure that all four jaws are good and tight. If you look closely, you can see that the hand on the dial indicator is still indicating some movement but that that movement is really quite irregular. It could even be qualified as jerky. That irregular jerky motion indicates that the part is not truly round. If I don't pay attention to that irregular jerky motion, I notice that the dial returns pretty well to the same number all the time. That indicates that even if the part has an irregular surface, this is about as center as it's going to be. In this case, I can't do better than that. Don't make yourself sick trying to center a part that isn't perfectly round. It just can't be done. This part is as centered as it's ever going to be. A quick final verification. All seems well. We can remove our dial indicator and move on to the machining. Now, centering a square section part is quite different from centering a cylindrical part, but not at the beginning. Our visual centering is actually quite similar. So let's get to that visual centering, perform it, and then we'll look at what is really different, the use of the dial indicator when centering a part of square section. Just as we did with the first part, the cylindrical one, we're going to start by putting this part visually as center as possible. Once that I'm satisfied with this first very rough and visual centering, I can move on to using my gauge lines, the ones on the face of the chuck, to verify that each one of the chuck jaws is positioned in a similar fashion to those gauge lines. So there, I think I can do a little better than this, so a few more final adjustments and then we can move on to comparing our part to a fixed entity, just as we did with our last part. So let's move our tool post, or if you prefer our fixed entity, in a little closer to the work part. Outside corners should never be used for accurate positioning of work parts. That's because an outside corner has either a radius edge or a burr on it. There's no such thing as a perfect outside corner. But since we're still in the rough centering mode here and not in our final positioning, we can use those corners. And we're going to compare those four corners to the fixed entity. That should get us on center within five or ten thousandths of an inch. So let's take a good look at my four corners and I can see here that this is the corner that's the closest to my fixed entity. So I'm going to have to push the part away from that tool post and to do so this time I'm going to have to loosen both jaws in the direction I want the part to move. Because I'm working on corners, the corner falls between two jaws and then obviously snug up the two opposing jaws. And as I did with our first example, we're going to carry on with the adjustments until I'm satisfied with the centering of the part. Once I've centered my eye as well as possible my square section part, well, I can back everything off, give myself a little room, 
reinstall my dial indicator, and move on to the fine tuning. Well, now that my part is close to center, I'm going to position the surface the furthest away from me in a, an approximately vertical position. And with my dial indicator approximately at center height, I'm going to come and touch the side of the part by about ten thousandths of an inch. Once in contact, I can pivot my part just slightly, not turn it, just pivot it to find the lowest spot on that surface. Your lowest spot is easy to find because if the dial never makes it to one of the corners, it'll be the spot where the dial changes direction. Once you've found it, set the zero on your dial indicator scale to that point. You should center square parts by working with opposing pairs of surfaces. The dial is set on zero for this surface, so let's back the dial off, turn the part 180 degrees, come back to the opposing surface, pivot our part just slightly, find the lowest part of that surface, and verify the difference between the two sides. Now, I can see here that I'm 20 thousandths of an inch difference from one surface to the other. So that means that I'm ten thousandths of an inch out of center. And that in order to center the part, I'm going to have to bring it towards me. So let's try tightening this jaw just slightly. And I can see that it's quite tight already. So I'm going to loosen the opposite jaw and come and retighten that back jaw, pushing the part towards me. Keep an eye on the indicator. Once you've moved ten thousandths of an inch or come back half the difference, you should be on center. So re-pivot your part. Make sure that you're at the lowest spot on that surface. Reset your indicator to zero and check once again. Ramp off. Ramp on. Pivot. Oh, we're about one thousandths of an inch out. So I just barely have to push the part away from myself by only approximately a half a thousandths of an inch. Really, not very much. Reset your dial to zero, and we can ramp off, turn 180, come back, ramp on, pivot, and everything looks good. My opposing surfaces here are on center. Now, the other pair of opposing surfaces won't be centered in the same way. All I have to do is pivot by 90 degrees, and come and find the low spot on that third surface. Since the part is square, and since I've set the dial to zero on the previous pair of surfaces, well, all I have to do is move this surface until I read zero on the dial, and all four surfaces should be centered. So I'm going to push the part away from myself just slightly, keeping an eye on the dial, to return to the same zero that I had on my previous pair. So I can ramp off, ramp back on 180 degrees further, and recheck by pivoting. A slight adjustment here, I'm just barely a thousandths of an inch off. A final check of each side, pivoting each time. And the job is done. This part is good and centered. Centering a large diameter and relatively short part in a four-jaw chuck is really identical to centering a cylindrical part. But there's one difference. When I centered this cylindrical part, I wasn't worried about end thrust. In this case, I am. An end thrust is when the end surface describes an axial movement when in rotation. Now, that has to be corrected during the centering. So what we're going to do is put the part in our four-jaw chuck, center it as we would have centered our normal cylindrical part, then check the end thrust. Adjust that end thrust by lightly tapping on the part to sit it properly in the lathe, and then re-centering a second time, thus ensuring that we have a cylindrical part centered that has no end thrust. This obviously is only done if the end of the part has already
already been machined square to the outside diameter. Now that I've centered the outside diameter of this part, I can now come and verify for my end thrust. And for that I'm going to want to move my dial indicator. I'm going to position it in a way to give myself access to the face of the part, because I'm going to use that indicator to ensure that the face of the part is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. I want to make very clear that this isn't an operation that you do on any part that isn't incredibly accurate on its end. If you're going to be machining the end, you're going to make it perpendicular when you cut it, not when you install it in the chuck. So once the dial indicator is repositioned, run it over the end surface of the part, from the outside diameter towards the center. What you want here is zero movement on the dial. You can then return close to the outside diameter without exiting the part. Turn 90 degrees and swipe back towards the center of the part. The first swipe, the turn, the second swipe. If you have no movement of the dial along this path, well the end of your part has no end thrust. It is perpendicular to the axis of rotation and nothing more needs to be done. However, if you do have end thrust, you're going to have to adjust it. And we're going to adjust it by tapping on the end with a positioning hammer or with a brass punch and a relatively small ball peen hammer. No rubber mallets here. We want nice crisp strikes, but we don't want to damage the part. Since adjusting the face of the part will alter somewhat the centering, it's good to recenter the part one final time before moving on to the machining. Well, there you go. Three different parts, three very similar ways of centering them, but each with their little particularities. It's important though to note that in the machine shop, we can go from rough to very accurate in one foul swoop. Precision is something you creep up on gradually. And that's what we tried to apply here in this beginner's video about centering in the lathe. We did a purely visual centering at start. Then we did the visual comparative centering to finally move on to a dial indicated centering, which ultimately was quite accurate. So remember, regardless of what you do in the machine shop, approach precision gradually. It's a bit like a good relationship. So, happy machining. Hey.